to our final lecture of the season. I can't believe it's over already. Wow, that was quick. Um, our last lecture, I'm going to tell you about in a minute, but I want to make a couple of quick announcements, first of all, because we have a lot of things coming up here. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock is the annual meeting of the Historical Society, which takes place right here in this room. And there's going to be a guest speaker, Helen Harrison, is going to talk about the history of the Springs art community from the 1940s to today. I think that's going to be fascinating. Tomorrow afternoon from 2 to 4, we're going to have a celebration at Mulford Farm for the completion of the Hedges Edwards Barn. I'm sure you've all been watching that go up. We're all very excited about it. It's a beautiful barn. We're very excited about it. It's going to be a wonderful education space. So please come by tomorrow. It's supposed to be a nice day tomorrow. Um, so between 2 and 4, stop at Mulford Farm and check that out. And then our exhibit on uh, opening May 11th, the opening, uh, opening party is May 11th from 4 to 6 here at Clinton Academy, and it's going to be on Artists at Home, the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, which the Thomas, Moran, Thomas and Mary Nimmo Moran Studio has just been accepted into. We're very excited about that, so you might want to come by for that exhibit. It'll, it'll take place for weeks, but the opening is May 11th at 4 o'clock, so please stop by there if you have a chance. Now, tonight, our own Richard Barons, who we'd love to hear, um, is going to talk to us about the rise and fall of the Menhaden fishing industry. Anyone who grew up here will remember very well when Promised Land was in operation because you could smell it a long way away, <laughs> right? If you went to the beach at Albert's Landing, you knew when you got out of the car the wind was blowing in the wrong direction. So um, I'm fascinated to hear what he has to say about it, and I'm sure you will love it. Richard? I want to warn you all, I want to warn you all, that someone asked me, a historian in fact, last week what I was speaking about. And they said, oh, how interesting. Um, tell us a little about it. So I started to tell him about it, and his eyes started to glaze over. <laughs> I said, that really isn't very interesting, is it? <laughs> it's a history lesson. Not all history lessons are fun, right? So, on, a, on April 29th, 1648, <laughs> 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 the God of the Manhattan <laughs> almost 371 years ago to the day, April 29th, an agreement was made between the governor of the New Haven colony and the governor of the Connecticut colony with the sachems of various uh, native colonies, including Mantuckets and Shinnecocks, to annex the lands from the eastern boundaries of Southampton Town beyond to the east side of Napeak, N-A-P-E-A-K, to be sold to the inhabitants of East Hampton. It is this famous Indian deed that the word Napeak first appears in our town records, and of course, it's because of this deed that we had town records, right? So, they were very, the colonists were quite excited about most of the land that they got. But they really could have given a damn about the land beyond the Amagansa. It really didn't offer any prospect. And so therefore, it remained pretty pristine up until probably the 19th century. There are several spellings of Napke. There's Napke, N-A-P-E-A-K-E, Napeck, N-A-P-E-C-K. And there are also a number of translations of the word, um, since translation is always a coining quote term when we're talking about native, native languages. But the most common one which Tooker came up with was waterland. Place of good water is another one. And an interesting one recently by a historian, an English historian at Oxford, who was doing work on Northeastern native languages is place of heaven or place of the gods. And it's only interesting because of the much later name that it's called. 
you know, um, the area that we're going to be talking about, um, province mining. Within 10 years of the first treaty, Reverend James, who was a great acquirer of properties out here, received a, day, a deed in some Napig acres. This is only the second time that Napig appears in the town records. So it took 10 years to get in the town records again. So it was not a piece of area which was particularly popular, and that's probably the reason that Reverend James bought it so inexpensively. If bumper stickers are to be believed, and today's Montauk is the end of the world, then Napig must certainly have seemed to the English colonists as the desert on the way to the end of the world. <laughs> Hannah Mott wrote a friend in 1782 about her trip to Montauk Point, which, by the way, she enjoyed. But the way there, she called an endurance of long boredom through flat, uninhabited, treeless sandscapes clouds of biting insects, and almost impassable roads. Her next sentence, which was charming about a friend she was sitting next to on the passage, the next one said, it was the roughest part of the world I had ever seen. Of course, we don't really know how much of the world she had seen. <laughs> but anyway, it was that. So, Napig became something of an endurance on the way to the rich pasture lands of Montauk, which we acquired uh, some years later. Tonight's story is about Napig's fish factories, but we need to construct a little bit of background, some rather old background. We need to talk about the history of fertilizer for a couple minutes. The ancient civilizations, the Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, and Romans, <laughs> all recorded using manure and wood ash to revitalize and enhance enhance the productivity of their fields. And though crop rotation isn't referenced until about 1730, it seems likely to have been used in Flanders way earlier. The populations in Europe were so fast outpacing their farmland that sources for food for the tables of Europe were a primary reason for exploration. In 1497, John Cabot, working for King Henry VII, sailed to Newfoundland and reported back in quotes, we could bring so many fish that this kingdom would have no further need of Iceland. Now, why does he mention Iceland? <laughs> Iceland is where fishing had been being done, particularly by the English and the French, uh, for three to 400 years before this time. So it was the major source of, of fish, uh, particularly for the Europeans, since they're really the Europeans weren't big fishers in the first place. By, 17, by 1517, there were reports that there were over 150 European fishing boats based in Newfoundland. The fish of the New World were feeding the mouths of the old. Captain John Cook, who named New England New England, wrote in his 1616 book a description of New England, talked about, in quotes, an incredible abundance of all sorts of fish. Reverend Francis Higginson in 1630 also wrote about the abundance of, of sea fish. And his quote is, almost beyond believing had I not seen them with my own eyes. But the most important was William Bradford's 1622 description of how Cape Cod native people made their gardens so productive by planting a fish in with their corn as fertilizer. The New World could supply fields for planting, oceans for fish, and abundance of soon-to-be-discovered other riches to profit uh, various countries who thought that they discovered the New World, even though it belonged to someone else and was inhabited. Edward Winslow wrote also in 1622 of his watching the native people use herring in great abundance to some 20 acres of corn as manure, which produced basket full of corn. The fish that Winslow is most likely talking about is the hero of tonight's program, the Atlantic Manhattan. H. Bruce Franklin writes in his 2007 book, The Most Important Fish in the Sea, and I quote, not one of these fish is destined for a supermarket, a canning factory, or a restaurant. Manhattan are oily, foul-smelling, and packed with bones. Yet they are the principal fish caught along the Atlantic coast. Now, this is 2007. 
exceeding the tonnage of all other species combined. The Narragansett called these fish, and heaven knows how you pronounce this, M U N N A W H A T T A E U G, <laughs> which translates to that which fertilizes, or he who fertilizes. The colonists named them moss bunkers, the Dutch were first to use that term, pog haden, or bony fish, and later fishermen called them bug heads, because they have big eyes, or bunkers. They are flat, they have soft flesh with distinctive, deeply forked tails. They rarely exceed more than 15 inches in length and are bright, shiny silver. Their distribution range is from the Jupiter Inlet. And this map that you're looking at here is from 1880 in a book called The Manhattan, in fact. Uh, from Jupiter Inlet, Florida, to Nova Scotia. They migrate in June along the East Coast, very close to the water, in huge groups. Mature adults typically are found in the Northern Range, while the juveniles locate in the South. They travel in large, slow-moving, tightly packed schools with their mouths wide open to strain the plankton and algae, which is their food. One of their roles is to be food for striped bass, bluefish, mackerel, flounder, tuna, and sharks. And I was talking to an old boniker the other day, Bayman, who said that when, the, when his dad would spot one of these, because of their birds surrounding them on the, on the shore, of uh, when they'd spot this dark color of all these Manhattans, uh, you could go out and you could just see the bluefish tearing them apart because mm -hmm. they're one of their staple, staple foods. So one of the reasons that they are so busy. And I for, it seems to me that if I recall, the female produces 250,000 eggs at a time. Busy gal. <laughs> 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 They're also a source of food, obviously, for egrets and ospreys, seagulls, and many other seabirds. It was their use as a fertilizer that endeared the Manhattan to the colonists. Without them, large-scale farming would have been almost impossible in the 18th and 19th century, New England and Long Island. Since the first English immigrants arrived in the East End in 1639, and we're talking about the gardeners, Cattle raising was their major enterprise. They were all made possible by, this was made possible by vast pasture lands uh, that greeted the first black <coughs> settlers because of the deforestation that the Native Americans had done. It was also about sheep, cows, horses. Little dirt farming was done except on home lots. But by the mid 18th century, the local population had expanded and farming was necessary to to supply this new and growing contingent of people from away. Though the Loman Bridge Hampton was extraordinary, most of our sandy sea fields needed to be re either rejuvenated or expanded, and this meant fertilizer. By the 18th century, Southampton farmers were using fish to make their elderly, worn out soil profitable. In 1792, Ezra Lahamadou, who owned a farm in Southampton, lived in Manhattan and was uh, the gardener's lawyer, reported to the New York Society for the Promotion of Agriculture that one of his neighbors, a Mr. Glover, in quotes, had spread the Manhattan fields with great success. This may be the first time the word Manhattan appears in press. So it's really a word, 18th century, which really combines several Native American words. If the East End of Long Island had industries, in the mid-1700s, it would have had to have been whaling and cattle. Yes, there were salt, salt uh, works in North Haven, but whaling and cattle ranching were paying the bills. But by the dawn of the mid-1800s, whaling was in decline, and by the end of the century, the pasture lands had been mostly sold off in Montauk. We were ready for a transitional source of income, and it was spelled F-I-S-H. In many ways, the fish oil business was a godsend. In its infancy, it certainly kept the old whalers at work, boiling their heavy cast iron tripods when whaling became unprofitable and they disappeared. 
This principally happened because of the high cost of procuring and processing whale oil compared to the cost of drilling and transporting petroleum from the oil fields in Pennsylvania. The new cheaper oil could do all those things that whale oil did, lighting, engine lubricating, tanning, uh, paints, and soap making. But the oil boiled off Manhattan could do exactly the same thing. And in fact, by the, night, by the turn of the 20th century, was one of the major stabilizers in European margarine. I mean, Manhattan oil. You know, I never liked margarine anyway. <laughs> the first successful fish oil business recorded was in Portsmouth, Rhode Island in 1811. The factory was destroyed by a hurricane in 1815, but they rebuilt, and by 1841, they were cooking Manhattan by steam in wooden tanks. John Howard Payne rem reminisced about visiting his aunt here in the 1830s and hearing the trumpet sound while watching the rush of East Hampton men leaving their shops and fields to dash down to the beast, beach to harvest what many people have assumed they were harvesting, somehow in history books, they'll say he was talking about whaling. Of course he wasn't, he was talking about bunkers. This is an illustration of the Persane boat uh, setting out to catch uh, bunkers. It's from 1880. It's quite romantic looking, it's a wood block. In 1847, Marcus Osborne set up a pot works on Jessup's Point in Southampton to cook bunkers. And recently we found a diary of a young Southampton lad. He wasn't really young. He was in a one-room school in Southampton. He was about 18 years old and was the oldest student in the class. And he probably never got out of the class because the diary, which is just for one year, at least half of the time, he's gathering bunkers. And what he does for us, which is so amazing, is at the end of the day, he tells you how many baskets of bunkers he and his friend harvested. And one day they harvest 55 <coughs> bushels of bunkers. And that's in the 1850s. And he then goes and sells them. Uh, so he was making money. Why should he go to school, right? <laughs> anyway, that's what some people say. This shows you the first thing fishing with the main boat on one side over there, then the, the two boats and the net there in the middle, and this is also from 1880. Most of Napique Harbor still belonged to East Hampton Town because of the Indian Dee. The land was not populated and looked much as it did in 1648. F.J. Gavitt of Shelter Island was the first to propose to lease land from the town trustees at the mouth of Napique Harbor in 1858. His lease was for one year, and the terms were $20. By 1866, at least 10 factories, most of them ma managed or owned by local whaler, whalers out here, were on or near the harbor. Though most renters uh, began to take over from the locals, and those renters, within a couple of years, were coming from either eastern Long Island or uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut, or Milford, Connecticut. A further boost to this fledgling industry, this is an illustration of the mate boats, of the Persine mate boats from 1877, and it's a drawing by Captain Conklin from Emma Ganson. A further boost to this fledgling industry was the higher cost of competing fertilizers such as gypsum and lime. The most expensive and likely best was guano, bird droppings, that were mined in the Caribbean, Patagonia, the Chinchilla Islands of Peru, and later Baja and California. Imported Chinese laborers uh, were often used to mine these uh, nitrogen-rich products, uh, which could be sometimes, since you're talking about thousands of years of birds pooping out on an island. So you're, you're looking at sometimes 60 feet. It's almost like a mountain of guano. So it is, in fact, mined. And because so many of the Europeans 200 years before this had destroyed the Indian population of so many of the islands in the West Indies, they were importing Chinese laborers to dig the product, which was so desirable that 
In fact, the guano was so desirable that New, the United States passed the Guano Islands Act of 1856. You never know what they'll sign. <laughs> Giving U.S. citizens who discovered a source on an unclaimed island exclusive rights to deposits. And it's interesting, today, nine of our uh, island properties uh, are properties that came to us through the Guano Law. And it's sort of fun that, remember we talked earlier in the year about uh, sh shipwrecks. Remember the John Milton uh, yeah. being wrecked? And do we remember what was in the hold of the John Milton? Guano. So Guano was coming here secretively. Without... This is a romantic picture um, that is from 1879. And this is an illustration done by one of the artists from the Tile Club who captured this very dramatic sunsetting scene of the, of the catch of the Manhattan. The nets were huge. They got larger and larger, and they had large wheels in which to uh, store them on and to dry them before they went out. And here's an illustration. Of it. And you've probably seen old photographs that have these giant nets on them. They were all up and down the, down the shore. And this is another one. This has been captured by an artist in 1879. Daniel Wells of Greenport had visited Southampton's Osborne fish factory, but decided that he did not like the primitive nature of it with big metal kettles and uh, lots of, of kindling. He thought that a lot of, of the oil was wasted, that it was probably evaporating. So he visited a, he visited a factory in Rhode Island uh, where they used steam, and he opened his factory on Shelter Island in 1850, in the Chiquit Point in Shelter Island. Within the next decade, numerous small factories sprang up and down the north and south shores of Peconic Bay. Deep Hole and Springs had a very large factory, of which is a very poor photograph of the factory that's almost unreproducible, but it's one of the earliest images we have of these uh, shacks that were built for these factories. They also have the Northwest Harbor factory, Cedar Bush, Napeak Harbor. The factories were seen as bad neighbors because of the intense stink from the cooking <coughs> process. So the fish factories look for unpopulated areas to have their businesses. I mean, here's a detail of what we know of is Promised Land from 1873. And you'll notice that there's really not, it's mostly just names of owners. You don't really see many references to factories or anything of that nature. But very soon it will change. This is really the oldest image we have of, of one of the factories on Napig. And this is the fish factory at Napig in 1880. And consolidation began as companies began buying out the family operations. One of the reasons that the Shelter Island plants in an area then called Bunker City uh, needed to be relocated was the birth of the boarding house era. And once again, the stink from the boiling pots of those dead fish did not seem to encourage city borders. Communities forced these factories to relocate and with Within the barren and neighborless Napig nearby, so available, it was the obvious choice. And besides this illustration of the plant, which somehow it looks like it has a giant mountain behind it, but it was an artist who did it after all. <laughs> Anything for contrast. There are two amazing wood blocks that show us the inside of the factory from 1880. And so this is the big sort of, it's a metal, it, it looks like it's a net, but it's really a big metal wrought iron uh, that takes, moves the fish over to the kettles, and then this next one will show you. And they're made very much like the water tanks on the top of New York City buildings that were put in about the same time. And this would have been called the cook room. And this is preparing, um, that during the early period they sometimes would uh, removed the flesh from the bone, but as time went on, they began to grind it all up as part of the meal. And this is also from that bunker 
uh, factory. You can see the grinder there up on figure, was it 37 up there? And the, even the little spoon that you use and the knife. So this is from the 1902 Beecher Hyde Atlas. And here we can see the American Agricultural Chemical Company that's formed on promised land because of buying up, well at that time buying up the rents, but it changes pretty quickly. And then this is going up a little further uh, to the east, and this is another fish factory just continuing up the, up the arc of the, of the bay there. After the close of the Civil War, the demand for Manhattan oil skyrocketed. In 1867, the magazine Scientific American published an article called Manhattan Oil Mania. Besides the oil, a big part of the profits came from the manufacturing of commercial fertilizers. The scraps of the boiled fish were mixed with phosphate brought in from South Carolina to create a mix that was particularly useful in Connecticut Valley for the tobacco fields there where they were growing the large leaves that you rolled the tobacco in from the south. There were good times, there were bad times. In 1891, an ammonia company built a plant only to see its first season was abysmal. In 1894, another plant closed, sold their steamers at auction. Soon after, the fish came back because the fish are fish. They are not prone to always do the same thing at the same time. So you may have five extraordinary years, then you may have a bad year, then you may have five years when there's just not enough fish here at all. So. It's always a crapshoot, there's no question about it. Soon after, the, soon after the, in 1894, the fish came back. Uh, one steamer caught over a million fish in three days. And how did they count the fish? <laughs> They're all about 12 inches long. <laughs> so, so in New England, someone carved little fish. You'd think they would have just used the fish, but carved little wooden fish and put them in a barrel and that's then counted how many were in there and that's how many. So that's how you can tell. So that's why you will every once in a while find in a book a reference to how many fish, you know, we caught 50,000 fish in three weeks and you wonder, who's counting these things? It's all statistics. By 1895, the Long Island Railroad uh, added a spur to the factories. It had been calculated that there were almost 100 fish factories lining the coast from Maine to Virginia. In 1874, the town trustees resolved to renew um, no existing land leases for fish oil factories at Napeague Harbor for less than $100. <laughs> Get them smart. By 1879, the trustees begin to stop leasing and begin to sell off the Napeague lands. The trustees finally realize the value of Napeague Shore. So we have some pretty amazing photographs of the fishing process and the boats. Sadly, a whole lot of them have come to us without any information whatsoever. Sometimes we can use a glass to determine the name of the boat. Uh, but it's often hard to determine just exactly what the age of some of these photographs are. This one, though, does have a date on the back of it. It's 1898, so it's one of our oldest photographs we have that show the men in the, in the boats, which would be the per se boats, putting out them. By 1877, the report of commissioners of fish and fisheries reported 13 official manufacturers of Manhattan oil between West Hampton and East Marion, owning to a total of 32 vessels ranging in weight from 8 to 22 tons. This is dated 1910, loading the bunker boat. So this is loading the, look at loading the steamer. In 1879, there were four factories, since we've gone through consolidation. The Jonas Smith plant, the Tuthills Falcon Works, the Ranger Oil Company, and Dixon Works. Promised Land was busy enough that George Conklin opened a general store, and it was there on May 1st, mark it in your calendar, of that year 
that a group of men met at the store because they were getting a post office. And what did they need for their post office? They needed an address. <laughs> you could have said East Amagansett, right? Nepi, Nepi Center. There were two people, Mr. Conklin and one of his cronies. One said it should be called the Land of Promise. Mr. Conklin, who owned the store and hence was going to be the postmaster, said, let us name it Promised Land. The promise of commerce in the area, indeed, one local called the fumes from oil pots, the smell of money. <laughs> it's this promise that may be the reason for the term Promised Land. There are lots of other really crazy reasons, but not this one seems to be correct. The post office continued until it burned down in 1899. About 1920, loading the bunker boat. In 1912, a floating fish factory was fitted with a big barge as a tender. One historian said that, in quotes, it proved to be unsuccessful as every other floating fish factory had, end of quotes. In 1914, a huge coal pocket was built on Sickler's deck, dock in Promised Land. So the boats, and this is interesting, heretofore the boats, the steamers, had to go at the end of the week on the weekend to New London to get their coal. There was no source of coal. It was big enough to take care of all of these bunker boats. So this, this coal thing was brought here so we could have our own coal. We could buy it from Mr. Sickler, of course, but it was much easier than going to London to coal up, as the men called it. Now, the hold is full, but there's still more bunkers. <laughs> this is about 1925. And there are some that are even more so. I mean, there's no record of any bunker boat sinking because it had too many bunkers. <laughs> it seems logical to imagine that such a thing might, might happen. Now, the other thing that's important to remember is the bunker, because it's so oily and fleshy, doesn't last well. It begins to, it begins to, to spoil to a high intensity within 24 hours, which is why during the run of the bunkers, which was from May until early October, um, most of the factories were 24-7 because you couldn't store it. They'll take care of that in a few moments, but they, at this time you couldn't store it. So, A number of these photographs have never been published before <clears throat> because they were recently given to the Historical Society by Ed Sherrill, uh, who gave us about 160 photographs of the, of the bunker trade and also later on his uh, family's involvement in you know pleasure boats for shark hunting and things of that nature. So. These are pretty, pretty wonderful, nice early ones, and these usually have a date on the back of them, so this is 1925. In 1897, the big news around Mr. Conklin's pot-bellied stove was that the English firm Standard Oil Company was interested in the fish factories. They incorporated as American fisheries with $10 million, this is 1897, with $10 million in capital and quickly bought out the seven promised land factories, as well as the largest factory on the coast in Rhode Island, two factories in Delaware and one in Texas. There's another bunker that is in the Texas area, not the Atlantic bunker. Standard Oil meant business. Bad luck struck in September 1899 when one of the factory buildings caught fire. The loss was calculated at $1 million. Gone were the scrap sheds, the general store, that's why the post office wasn't there any longer, and the telephone exchange. But with great catches, the factory continued full steam ahead. By 1902, which was an extraordinary year, the plant had 27 steamers, 1,700 employees and processed 1,375,786 barrels of Manhattan. Now, if we multiplied that by, we could know exactly how many fish there was. <laughs> no, um, 
We'll get to that, but it's a good question. Congratulations. And uh, about 80% of them were. So this is a steamer, circa 1915. It's one of our oldest photographs we have. This is the old McKeever factory on Hicks Island. And it had been used since, uh, and this is a boat that was part of the McKeever uh, group of steamers. The McKeever factory did not last very long. The old factory was on Hicks Island, and the you know what the original spelling of Hicks is, right? H-I-X, that's what it is for the first 150 years of the town records. Hicks Island, it had been used since the early 1920s, but during Prohibition, uh, the plant just sat there, it was empty because the, the Hicks firm closed, and during Prohibition, it was used as a storage place for the rum runners. <laughs> And the interesting story about that is, is that it proves that traditions do, do die hard out here in the east end of Long Island. Because even though Prohibition was over, the men who had been run runners found that they could buy cheap liquor in Canada, bring it here and sell it for more money, and didn't have to pay any taxes, so, you know, the federal government wouldn't find out about it. So in other words, we didn't stop running <laughs> and it was mostly uh, grain alcohol, and it came in metal tin, shiny tin containers, big, and then were poured into anything you wanted it to be poured into. Now, they were loading an old bunker boat that had been on use for about 20 years and was decided that it just wasn't worth repairing. And they were loading the boat to the gills with all of these metal tins of, of liquor. When the boat started to collapse in front of their very eyes as they were on a falling apart dock on, on Hicks Island, and they just sort of watched, because they really couldn't do anything about it. They just sort of watched, and all of a sudden a gentle breeze came over and it started moving this thinking boat, which they thought was probably, you know, headed onto Block Island. There was a storm that night, and the next morning, the beaches of Hicks Island were, and the other, and the, the nappy were completely covered with metal tins filled with liquor. <laughs> and a local person who wrote a letter about this back to his uh, brother who was in college at Cornell, made the comment that you would have been surprised, brother, at the fancy cars and the fancy East Hampton people all came after church to get their liquor. <laughs> so times, I guess, don't change as much as we think. Uh, very little change in first uh, saying this is uh, 1940. And these are particularly detail. Now let's look at some of the boats. This is the Elias F. Wilcox, which was built in 1922. This is a photograph taken in 1947. In 1907, the fish were few and far between, but by July there were enough to process. Early in the morning of July 31st, the entire factory burned to the ground. In October, the American Fisheries Company, which was the subsidiary of Standard Oil, declared bankruptcy. The property was bought by Heller Hirsch Company, and the factory was rebuilt, and so, but sold that winter to the Atlantic Oil and Fertilizer Company of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. This is the Mary A. Edwards photograph, probably the early 50s, maybe late 40s. This is a beautiful uh, one really showing the activity. And you can see it's similarity to whaling, can't you? Just the, just the fact that we're dealing with fish rather than animals and size, obviously. Um, this steamer is the, is the steamer East Hampton, and it was built on May 1913 at Rockland, Maine. It was 175 feet long. Um, its capacity was 3,000 barrels of fish and it was captained by Herbert N. Edwards, Sr. And this photograph was given to the historical society by the late captain. You can just vaguely see that lots going on here. This is the Pocahontas. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1947. About 1945, and this is a vacuum that vacuumed the, the, you know, the, 
the boats bring in the, the net and they're all there congregating and then this is a big vacuum that vacuums them into the hold of the, of the ship. And if you don't have the, that, that's, that's not a vacuum, so the two different ways. Now this bucolic image, a postcard of the landing at Devon, Long Island, or what one might say the promised land, um, this was sent in 1910, so it was probably printed you know, a year or two before that. Hand-colored German card with one of the wooden factories there. Is that the stack that still yeah, exists? I'm pretty sure. This, I think, is an amazing photograph, yeah. taken about 1915. Um, my guess is, um, you know, young, young lovers, maybe from Devon, uh, could be from anywhere. Um, but look what's in the background, the fish factory. And that I use as a prelude to Devon and the fish factory. This is Mrs. Mortimer Levering's house, built around 1906-1907. Chapter 4 in A History of Devon Colony is entitled The Nuisance. <laughs> Do we have to even guess what the nuisance is? <laughs> <laughs> the ruins of the old fish factory, and I'm quoting, the ruins of the old fish factory seem to imply that the odiferous fish factories were not going to be a problem for a group of wealthy businessmen from Cincinnati who decided to buy almost 2,000 acres of land in beautiful area of Amagansett called Cranberry Hole in 1906. But by 1909, the Manhattan had returned. <laughs> and the crews were renovating the factory. Though the owners assured the new summer colonists that measures were being taken to prevent any foul odors from acting <laughs> over the Devon mansions, they did. The colony filed an injunction to have the factories closed, citing it as a health hazard. The judge granted the fish factory 10 days to solve the problem. <laughs> I don't know really what was in his mind. <laughs> Anyway, um, the problem was not solved, and the fish processing continued to spew. The lawsuits grew more complicated, dragging on for almost a year. In May of 1910, a very successful season began to unfold for the fish factories. And by July, the appellate court threw out all of the colony's appeals, deciding in favor of the Atlantic Oil and Fertilizer Company. This photograph is it's a postcard dated 1925. This is Promised Land, a photograph from 1936 in the winter. Oh, sometimes it depended on the factory. The majority of the boats did not winter over in Napeed. They wintered over in mostly in New London and uh, that area. But the ships draw? You know, how much, how deep was the water there then? I really don't know. I really don't know. Because it's not very deep. And there's no reference ever to any dredging, certainly. Another view of Promised Land from 1935. Candid shot from the Edwards collection. Uh, this is dated uh, 1933, and it says Lou Saints and his friend. Well, his friend must be that rooster there. <laughs> the factory changed hands many times, and since about 1927, when the fish really disappeared. It, it, they just sat vacant. There were some small businesses, some, some making commercial oils for gardening, but it, it, there were no big factories. In 1933, much of the land and the factories was purchased by Gilbert P. Smith. The Smith family had fish oil in its veins. As a young man, Gilbert had worked at his father's small tripod business on Fire Island. 
Later, he and his brother started Smith Meal Company in New Jersey. Smith modernized the plant. He used spotted planes to find the schools of fish, introduced aluminum hulled seine boats to go with the steel bunker boats, which were now had refrigeration. So the catch didn't have to go back to the plant in 24 hours. Smith's new boats went as far as Narragansett Sound. Later, bunker boats were gas-driven, and some were even uh, diesel. Smith had a passion for buying property. He vastly enlarged the acreage that he had in, in that by mm -hmm. buying small pieces of property when they came on the market. And this was not important to his factory, but he seemed to be very interested in particularly buying areas which were naturally beautiful and not, not touching them. Here's one of the huge uh, same boats. This is probably three times the size of that early one that we saw the old woodcut. This is 1936. Another view of the, I mean, the factory is, is large, and you know, when you're hiking out there, you'll see parts of boilers and parts of the factory that you can sort of find. The plant ran 24 hours a day from mid May to mid October. 17% were seasonal labor force that came from Cal the Carolinas. They stayed in small cabins on the factory's grounds. Uh, there were 10 boats, 17 men on each, about 100 worked in the Smith plant, making a total payroll of about 300 employees, but probably producing about as much oil as the companies that had 1,000 employees, you know, 40, 50 years before that time. Now, it's interesting that, and you might not expect that um, artists would have been taken with the factories, but Edward Moran, a um, somewhat mysterious artist, I mean, he's, he's third generation. He's, um, he's Edward Moran's son, Percy Moran's son, but has the same name. And these prints are often seen as being done by Edward Moran, the famous maritime painter, rather than his grandson. This is, this is uh, Promised Land about 1940. Child Hassam did a beautiful etching of walking in the woods in Promised Land. Here's another Edward Moran of the factories, small etching. <coughs> this one is probably from about 1940. He was born in 1901 and died in 1946. But the most intriguing group of paintings only recently brought to the public are Mabel D'Amico's paintings, done in probably the early 40s, maybe as early as 1939, when she and her husband first came out here, were enamored and start what we know as the art barge. Um, and she did these wonderful works. The peak reached for the, for the Smith factory in 1957, when 213,097,000 Manhattan were landed at Promised Land. In 1968, only two boats were bunker fishing. In 1969, there weren't enough Manhattan caught, and the weather was uncooperative. The factory closed its doors forever. The Smith family owned a number of other factories and soon disposed of all of them to one owner. Another Mabel D'Amico. After the Second World War, much of the fish meal fed baby chicks for Ralston Purina, in fact, 90%. Peru had limited the fishing of anchovies for years. These anchovies were originally caught down there for fertilizer like the Manhattans. And so when Peru decided to limit that, it meant that there really was very little competition with the Manhattan companies. But in 1959, the country lifted all the regulations and the fish meal, uh, which was sold up here a year before, would have brought $120 uh, a ton, slipped below $50 a ton. And the rest of the story of the factory is really history. 
another to meet go. The family worked with the new owners to make sure none of the wetlands or natural habitats associated with their factory <coughs> lands, all of their factories, be developed. Through a gift and purchase, working with the Nature Conservancy, the 1,364 acres were turned over to New York State in 1978 and became Napique State Park. Today, the Manhattan is still a cash crop. It is still the most valuable uh, crop of fish uh, caught each year. Most of the fish meal goes to farm-raised salmon. So all of us eat a little bit of Manhattan. No question about that. And that's because 50%, well now they say it's 60% of all fish eaten in America are farm-raised. And that's the main thing, is the meal going to these fish. What's the other use? Omega-3. Those little tablets. They don't say cod liver on them. You can this. Um, so that's really the story. I mean, there's way more. All the different factories, all the different family names. Um, the whole concept of, of you know, the, how the land was uh, sold and how the land was uh, originally rented for so little, I think is a story in itself. But this gives you a little bit of background um, because I think certainly I had no idea that the businesses were so large. Even though I had seen the photos, I had not concentrated on the scale of the population, nor did I see until I started doing work, the relationship of it being a bridge, a bridge between whaling and tourists is probably a good way to put it, because it was the business, you know, that was really there to tide over all the many men who were involved in whaling. And then, of course, once we had the train come through, it meant that our regular baymen, who were not going after bunkers, could send their fresh fresh fish to the Fulton Market, which meant that there was another adjunct of fish, not factory, but fishing. So on that note, you can swim home. <laughs>